myself, Dr. Lalit Modi, co-organizing secretary of this webinar series. I welcome to all in this eighth webinar of Wet and I webinar series 2020. The topic of role of animal genetics and genomics for improvement of animal health and production, which will be delivered by Dr. Earth Chaudhary. I just introduced about Dr. Earth. Dr. Earth was completed his BVSC in the year 2014 from Anand Agriculture University, College of Veterinary Science, Anand. And after that, he completed his Master of Veterinary Science in the subject, subject of Animal Genetics and Breeding in the year 2016 from Madras Veterinary College, Tamil Nadu, Chennai. And after that, he is serving as Assistant Research Scientist in LRS, SDAU, Sardar Krishnagar, Gujarat. In this eighth webinar of VAC and I webinar series, we have a message from our Dean, Dr. Vibhi Karadi, sir, Principal and Dean of the Veterinary College, Nausari Agriculture University, Nausari. So, Dr. Vibhi Karadi, sir. Morning to all. I hope you all are safe and well at your place in this COVID-19 situation. We all know that due to the coronavirus, we all are under the lockdown period, which has affected the education of the students. But to mitigate this issue, Nausari Agriculture University. Nausari has developed E-class facility for the students under the guidance of Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Sunil Chaudhary. And I am happy to announce that all the teachers of veterinary college used this facility and completed the remaining curriculum during the lockdown period and also successfully completed the online examination. In addition to this, our teachers, Dr. Deepak Suthar and Dr. Lalit Modi, also started at NA webinar series 2020 on the various topics on clinical aspects for the benefit of undergraduate and postgraduate students, field veterinarians, as well as the teachers. I appreciate that the efforts are made by Dr. Sutan and Dr. Modi to use this critical COVID-19 period very efficiently to improve the knowledge of the students. And veterinarian working in the field through the digital platform provided by the IT department of the university. The web NIU webinar is not only useful for the Gujarat students and veterinarians, but also almost useful globally as per the participant registered in various webinars. I congratulate Dr. Suthar and Dr. Modi for the success of the Wet and webinar series to zero, to zero. and this that the best of thank you. For your blessings and I thanks along with with organizing secretary of the region to guidance for betterment of this webinar series. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Now, I request Dr. Arth Chaudhary to please start the webinar. Before starting the webinar, I request to all the participants, please off your mic as well as the webcam. It will be very helpful to us to improve the quality of the voice as well as the presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Arth, please. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Am I audible for all of you? 
Yes, doctor, you are clearly audible. Yeah. So, hello, good morning to everyone. I wish you all are fine, happy, and healthy too during this COVID-19 pandemic. I convey my best regards and thanks to the Dean of College of Veterinary Science and Animal Husbandry, Dr. Vipi Kharadi, sir, and Organizing and Co-Organizing Secretary and Staff of IT Department, Nausari Agricultural University, to provide me a good platform to share my views and information on animal genetics and genomics to participants who joined this webinar. Hello. So I am the presenter for today's webinar on role of animals. So I divided this presentation into a three section. The first section will be the basic genetics. The second section, what are the principles employed in the animal genetics and genomics? And the third one is the application of geno genetics and genomics for improvement of animal health and production. So how the genetic material works? Under this, we comprised of the basic structure of an eukaryotic cell, then the second one, the double helix structure of DNA and complementarity of the base pair. And third one, and last, what is codon? So the basic structural component cell comprised of the nucleus, then endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, mitochondrion, and cytosol and centrioles. So these are the basic cells. DNA and complementarity of the base pair, how it's made. So the envelope surrounding the nucleus is not merely hermetically sealed. There are the, some small pores so that some specific type of genetic materials can be transferred to the endoplasmic reticulum to synthesize the pro protein. So ribosomes is the responsible organelle for the synthesis of protein. And chromatin is the complex made up of DNA and proteins and is found inside the nucleus. So the cells is organized in a semi-loose way using a protein called as a bit of strings. So the DNA in the chromosomal form is highly condensed, tightly wrapped, and around uh, its binding with other shaping proteins. Each chromosome is shaped like letter X. So each chromosome can be divided into a two identical or sister chromatids by following the longitudinal axis, which is dotted uh, red line in the figure. So the two chromatids are connected by points, which is rarely in the middle of the structure and dividing each of the chromatids into a short arm and long arms. So the DNA is the double helix structure made up of four base pair, adenine, thymine, the histone proteins and completely unrolled. Its structure is look like a double helix. So double-stranded DNA is made up of four base pair, as I mentioned. If the DNA is described as a leader, links between the base pairs is makes the bars. So exactly what is the codon? So when looking to the DNA strands, a sequence of a three base pairs or three nucleotides comprise the codon. So then codon will convert into a protein after the process of transcription and translation. There are the different phases of mitosis in which the first uh, interphase is a S phase. And then afterward, the prophase, prometaphase, then metaphase, anaphase, and lastly, the telophase, and finally, the cytokinesis process will start. So this is the phase of normal cell proliferation it is called as a mitosis while on the right side the different phases of meiosis will occur during the process of spermatogenesis and gametogenesis so in this phase there are the various phases like prophase uh, one prof metaphase one anaphase one and telophase one so in uh, prophase two 
and metaphase two, the second phase of meiosis is just like a process of different phases of mitosis. So what is the genetic polymorphism? Genetic polymorphism is comprised of the creation of the genetic polymorphism under which there are the single poly, uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, insertions and deletions, and copy number of variations and inversion these things we will uh, see deeply in the next slides so in the effect of genetic polymorphism there are the various effects like structural versus regulatory variance additive recessive and dominance effects qualitative versus quantitative effect and third list but not last genotype and allele frequencies so exactly what is the mutation so permanent change in the hereditary material that, that either a change in the chromosome structure or number as in the translocation, deletion, insertion, duplication, or polyploidy, or change in the nucleotide sequence of a gene's codon. So SNP is characterized by the replacement of nucleotides by the another nucleotide, uh, it's called as a SNPs, or also called as a SNP. So nucleotide can be added or removed by the insertion or deletion. So changes in the genome due to insertion or deletion of nucleotides are significant. So in this example, on the right side, the insertion happened in the second codon and modified the third one as well as. So one or several nucleotides can be added or removed at a time. So the highest risk in this type of mutation is the creation of codon stock, which would terminate the protein synthesis prematurely. Then the number of repetitions is different between two individuals in the populations. So this is the newer field of genomics and it's mainly studied in the human medicine where the most well-known example is Huntington disease. Huntington disease is a progressive brain disorder. So in this, the copy number of variation and inversions are modification at chromosomal levels. So copy number of variation is defined by the replication of chromosome segments. So this is this is the repeated segment of chromosomes. While in inversion, uh, this chromosome is flipped end to end. That means that uh, chromosome segment will change its position into uh, a reverse direction. So what is allele? So allele is the alternative form of gene at a given locus. So genetic polymorphism lead to the formation of alleles. So for each pair of homologous chromosomes, one comes from the paternal lines, which is illustrated as a blue line, while one comes from the maternal line, which is illustrated as an orange line. That means that for a given gene, the version present on the chromosome may be different than the version present on the another one. And that is called as a heterozygous individual. In the case of represented on the right side of the allele, the version of the gene is identical between the male and female lines. The individual is therefore is called as a homozygous. So mutation can have various effects on the synthesis of protein. So SNP consequences can be completely invisible since the several codons can be coded for the same amino acids. And alternatively, insertions and deletions are more consequential because they disrupt the reading of the codon from the entire DNA. So sometimes genetic polymorphisms can lead to the creation of non-functional genes and that cannot be translated into a protein. The rest of the time, the gene is operative, but its sequence is slightly different and its function can be altered. So therefore, if the mutated gene is structural and consequences will be a modified protein, if the altered gene is regulatory, the consequences of the genetic polymorphism will be a modification of the expression of other genes compared to the original pre- um, mutation size. So transcription uh, which transforms the DNA into RNA and the series of uh, the RNA creates a series of amino acid, a protein. <coughs> so the three nucleotide from a codon which turn into code for an amino acid. So for example, on the right side of Rose's line, you can see the codon ECG in threonine. 
E, C, and G. Threonine uh, for the amino acid, and but we can also notice that it is not the only codon which is corresponding to the threonine. Here also A C A, A C U, and A C C also code for the threonine. And therefore, if there is a punctual mutation leading to the replacement of the nucleotide G by the nucleotide U. In the ACG codon, there will be no differences in the protein final products. So when two alleles of the same gene code for the different physical traits, two options are possible. First one, only one is expressed by taking over the effect of second. And on second, the two physical traits are expressed. So in the first case, the allele coding for the expressed physical trait, it is called as a dominant, while <coughs> the other non-expressed allele is called as a recessive. So in the blood type example, picture on the right side, the O allele is a recessive, while O allele is the recessive, and which means that for an individual to be the blood type O, and both chromosomes need to carry allele O. On conversely, if the one chromosome carry the allele A and the other one O, then the blood type will be a A because A is dominant and the, that will be expressed uh, allele. If the both the allele are dominant, they will both expressed as a shown with the blood type AB in this example. So in this example, blood type AB and this is called as a additive effects of both the dominant uh, alleles. So one single gene was coding for the phenotype blood type of the individual. It has a quant qualitative effect on phenotypes. A physical trait is usually polygenic. For example, it is coded by many genes and therefore it is difficult to identify each gene in the individual effect of the phenotypes. So physical traits are called as a quantitative trait. So considering a gene with qualitative effect on the phenotype of a fly, A is dominant allele and code for a phenotype long wings, while little A is a recessive allele and it's a code for a phenotype of short wings. So when Referring to the qualitative allele frequency in a population, for ease of calculation, in the first time we will consider a random fertilization model. In this model, the probability for a fly to have a genotype uh, big A, big A is, is P into P is equal to P square. In the same manner, the probability for a fly to have a genotype little a, little a is Q into Q is equal to Q square. So the probability of having a gamete A and one little a is P into Q is equal to PQ. Therefore, the probability for fly to have a genotype capital A and little a is P into Q plus P into Q is equal to PQ. So in overall, in our model, uh, the, in probabilistic man manner, the, a fly can either be a uh, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. So P square plus 2PQ plus Q square is equal to 1. So therefore, the probability of long wings uh, is equal to probability of capital A, capital A plus probability of big A, little a. So is equal to P square plus 2PQ. And probability of short wings, probability of little a, little a is equal to Q square. So for a... Um, recessive trace there only a one probability of little a little a so mendelian versus the quantitative trace so what is the mendelian trace controlled by a small number of genes while quantitative trace is controlled by a large number of genes and mendelian traits have a no impact or limited impact on environment while quantitative traits are affected by environments and these are the for example Coat color is a Mendelian trace, and Mendelian trace is analyzed by counts and frequencies. So, for a, uh, like a disease trace, 
healthy and sick if we will calculate as a frequency that uh, disease traits are comes under a qualitative trait but we will like uh, <coughs> analyze in a different way for example for disease traits some threshold value we will consider then and then this threshold value the particular threshold value uh, that beyond the limit of threshold value that will considered as a sick animals while other animals uh, lower the threshold value will considered as a healthy animal so by analyzing uh, like that it is comes under a quantitative traits and all are all quantitative traits have a normal distribution and standard deviation so quantitative trait low side so quantitative trait loci hello so quantitative trait is affected by uh, quantitative trait locus is a region on the genome that affect the phenotype for a quantitative trait so when two alleles of the same gene code for a different physical trait so quantitative trait is affected by multiple genes and many genes and spread across a genome we can find this gene by finding a loci that are variable in the population so in other word loci that are polymorphic and for which the genotype at that locus is associated with phenotype for a quantitative trait so for example if we can obtain a genotype for a genetic marker on a pig on a pig and we can find that we have a big q big q big q big q genotype that have a high Higher average weight than the pig having a big Q and little Q, or the little Q little Q genotype. Then we conclude that this genetic marker is associated with phenotype for this quantitative trait. So we can, however, not conclude that this specific marker polymorphism is positive, and that it is actually caused by change in the mean weight. it is actually more likely that the effect of the phenotype that we see is caused by another polymorphism that is close to the marker and that we have a genotype so this is called as a marker phenotype association study only enable us to identify a region on the genome that is affected by quantitative trait and we refer such a region as a quantitative trait locus so this quantitative trait locus is a region on the genome that contain a gene that has a genetic differences and that causes differences in the phenotype which we shown example uh, in a pig like mean body weight so in the past two decades many study have been conducted in many livestock species to identify such qtl using a genetic marker for many traits so this qtl findings have been compiled into a qtl database and dr jam rishi iowa state university he is the bioinformatics coordinator for national animal genome research program uh, in usa and apart from this qtl database we have a widespread database like ncbi so for cattle this database is called as a cattle qtl database and using this database we can for example get information on, on all the qtl that have been found in the literature and reported in the literature for example milk yield reproduction traits mastitis health traits and some other traits like immune capacity and uh, like exterior traits we can find from this database and you can you can also see that there are the several of this qtl and several of them comprise of a sustained substantial segment of the chromosome so of course this qtl mapping technique only allow us to find a general region on the chromosomes where a gene that affect the trait is located and so qtl information so we can see some qtls which is associated for a trait like 305 days milk yield in cat and genome while some qtl is associated by with a clinical mastitis in a cattle genome on chromosome number 
Well, some QTL is associated with foot and mouth disease susceptibility in cattle genome, which is on chromosome number seven, while some QTL is associated for the trait of reproductive eff efficiency. So what is QTL effects? So this graph illustrates that how we can quantify the effect of QTL or a genetic marker that is associated with quantitative phenotype. So the graph here plots the weight of peak this graph plots the weight of peaks uh, against the genotype at the QTL. At the marker for the case, we discussed already before that here the red dot, here the red dot represents the main weight of each genotype, uh, while the normal distribution around the red dot reflect that peak with a given genotype at that QTL can still vary substantially in their observed body weight. So this variation reflects the effect of all the QTLs across the genome, as well as the effect of environmental factors. So although a pig has a high body weight, for example, 110 kilogram, most likely will have a big Q, big Q allele, and it could also have a big Q, uh, little Q. So based on the regression line drawn to the genotype means, we can also define the additive effects of this QTL, which is the average change in the phenotypes from having a one extra copy of big Q. So the phenotype of big Q, little Q in QTL is a five kilogram greater then the average weight of little q, little q of your individuals. And uh, the higher weight of five kilogram for a big q, big q individual. So on an average, one copy of big q, this is just like an example um, by illustrating a peak model. So now in this specific example, the average weight of the heterozygous individual is exactly at the midpoint of two homozygous. So this is the heterozygous individual, which is the which is in the midpoint of two homozygous individual, and this makes the, this QTL to be more additive. So QTL effect dominance. So for example, it would be that the heterozygous individual have the same average weight. In this case. This QTL shows complete dominance with the dominance effect being equal to plus 5 in this example. So the dominance effect is a difference between the average phenotype of the heterozygous and the midpoint between the average phenotype of the two homozygous. Now this is the positive dominance effect and positive dominance effect are also the basis of heterosis. In other words, the crosses or crossbreeds, they tend to be a more heterozygous and they tend to have a higher phenotypes average than the parental breeds and this is referred to as a heterose. So what is allele substitution effects? Now in this case, the dominance we also need to reconsider the average allele substitution little q little q to big q little q increases the average phenotype by 10 kilograms while going from big q little q allele does not change the average phenotype at all now if the genotype frequency in this type of population are 25% little q, little q, and 50% big q, big q, and 25% big q, uh, little q, then each of these changes are equally frequent. So the average allele substitution effect is one half times uh, 10 plus a one half times zero is equal to plus five. So that is the same as we had for the additive locus in the previous slides. So now in practice, allele substitution effects are estimated by regression of the phenotype on the number of big Q allele, which is zero, 
वन एंड टू हाउ एवर इफ द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ लिटल क्यू इज मच लोअर देन द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ बिग क्यू देन द रिग्रेशन लाइन विल बी ए फ्लैटर तो the ll versus genotype the reason why we focus the ll substitution effect in other words the effect of alleles rather than the effect of genotypes because in breeding program we are interested in quantifying the value of individual as a parents and parents passed their alleles to the uh, their alleles to the progeny they don't pass their genotype during the process of meiosis so during meiosis gametes are formed that contain a random one of or two alleles that a parent carries at each locus then during the process of fertilization allele in the parental gamete are combined with the allele of maternal gamete to create that which sire and gametes are going to be mated to each other the best way to select this sire and gametes is to select animal whose allele have a highest average value both based on the effect of this allele as quantified by allele substitution effect and then the sum of this average allele effect across all loci for an individual is referred to as a breeding value of an animals so another way another way to look at this is that allele substitution effect and breeding value refer to the main effect of the allele in an experimental design in which allele are the treatment factors so in that context dominant effects then refers to the interaction between the alleles at the same same locus or the same genes so now we can have interaction between alleles or genotype at different loci as i illustrate here so and this are referred as a epistatic effect they can also be between alleles at a loci on different chromosome the graph that i show here shows the example of two pair of loci one without and one with the epistasis so this is one without and one another is the with the epistasis so the example on the left we have two loci that shows the dominance because the average phenotype of the heterozygous is not the midpoint of that of the two homozygous so that is not a straight line so it's like a band line so it is a broken line however here no epistasis because the effect of genotype at locus a is the same for every genotype at the locus b and that is the demonstrated by the lines being parallel to each other is the same for b1 b1 as it is for the b1 b2 and for a1 a2 so however in this example on the right side there is a epistasis because the effect of the a locus differ for individual that is for example have a b a1 a2 genotype at the a locus and therefore the individual that are homozygous are a1 and the uh, homozygous b2 so this line are not parallel reflecting the epistasis so in which we will cover the genetic model that is typically used to describe the phenotypes for a quantitative trait and we will also talk about the concept of heritability of quantitative traits the concept of breeding value of the animals and for a quantitative trait the concept of phenotypic and genetic correlation between the traits and how we can simultaneously select more than one trait in the population so we can we will also discuss on multi trait selection so in this section we will focus on quantitative trait which include many of the trait including many disease traits even those that are recorded in a discrete manner for example sick versus healthy and distinction between this mendelian and quantitative or complex trait we already discussed in previous slides so with quantitative trait being affected by multiple uh, or many genes 
or QTL along with external or environmental factors. So as we discussed, we also discussed the effect of individual QTL on the phenotype depending on the genotype that the individual has at the QTL. And the average effect of allele, which is based on the regression of the phenotype on the number of copies of a given allele that is individual carry. So the standard model that is used in quantitative genetics to describe an observed phenotype is that it is the sum of genotype and environmental effect or P is equal to G plus E. Here G represents the collective effect of genotype that the individual has at all the QTLs that affect this trace. And E is the collective effect of all the environmental factors for population of an individual, we find that phenotype often follow a bell-shaped curve or a normal distribution. So the phenotype in a population are then characterized by the mean and the standard deviation, or we can also call it as a variance of the phenotypes. So note that this phenotypic variance is the result of variance in geno genetic value among the individual or in other words, the variance of G and variance of environmental effect or the variance of E. So assuming that genetic and environmental effect are the independent and this result in the variance of phenotype or the, or the phenotypic variance to be the sum of the variance of genetic value and the variance of environmental effects. So the importance of genetics in explaining differences in phenotype between animals is known as a heritability. And it is defined as the proportion of phenotypic uh, variance that is due to a genotype or genetics or the ratio of genetic variance over the phenotypic variance. So all these variances are defined within a herd, thus Heritability is proportion of differences among the individuals within a herd that are the result of differences in the genotypes. So in this example, this diagram uh, further illustrates the concept of heritability. So if two individuals differ in phenotype by 200 units, for example, for body weight at a given age, and this is the trait, has a heritability of 0 0.25 then the average 25 of this difference that we see between individual in the phenotype is caused by the difference in the genetics between those individuals so the expected differences in the breeding value between those individual is equal to 25 percent or 200 which is equal to 50. So it is important to know that this is only a true on an average across the many individuals. So in reality, this is two particular individuals could be more similar in their genetics and more than 75% of the differences in phenotype we see may be due to a environmental effects for this pair of individuals. But on an average, 25% of the differences we see between the individuals within a herd are due to a genetics for this trace and with the heritability of 25 percent in this table in this table on the left side shows some typical estimation of heritability for the trait of relevance in a peak production so the trait related to the growth rate typically have a moderate heritability while the carcass composition while the carcass composition having the heavy heritability is around 50 percent and the trait related to the reproduction disease uh, reproduction disease like survival to winning uh, reproduction traits like survival to winning and other are typically low heritable traits uh, for example uh, the litter size which is uh, relevant to the reproduction traits having a uh, heritability around 0.1 percent 0.1 and survival to winning is 0 0.05. So a large proportion of the differences in litter size and survival among the peak in a herd are the result of environmental factors rather than the genetics. 
So trait heritability are important because they related to how effective selection on phenotype can be make more genetic improvement. So for example, if we select an individual for a breeding that have a highest phenotype for a trait uh, with low heritability, we expect only a small proportion or a, uh, how much better this animal are in their phenotype to be due to a genetics and transferred to the next generation. So an important concept here is the breeding value of an individual which related to the genotype of an individual for a QTL and the average allele substitution effect at those QTL that we do not uh, we have illustrated earlier. So for a single QTL, the breeding value of an individual represents the value of allele that animal passes into their progeny. So now, for example, for a single QTL, the breeding value for an individual for that QTL is the number of copy of a particular allele that the individual carry times the allele substitution effect. So in this example, the breeding value of a little q, little q, the breeding value of a little q, little q individual is zero times. Yes. Zero. And the breeding value of a heterozygous individual which have one big q and little q allele in one time five so equal to the breeding value is five while for the uh, homozygous big q big q allele individual have a two uh, two big q uh, allele so it carries times five so the sub allele substitution effect which is equal to ten Now, for a trait that are affected by multiple QTL or multiple alleles, we can get the overall breeding value of an individual as the sum of the breeding value at QTL that the individual has. So, for example, if the value of substitution treating a small letter allele by a capital allele is plus one, is plus one, so the allele substitution effect is plus one, then the breeding value of a given QTL is just the number of capital alleles that the individual carries at that QTL. And the overall breeding value is just the total number of capital alleles. So we can get it just by counting and for simplicity in this example. So then the breeding value of a sire in this example is eight. Uh, eight capital letter and the breeding value of the dam having a seven capital letter because she carries only seven capital alleles. So now alleles are passed onto their gametes after meiosis. So the genetic value of individual gametes in this example is also equal to the number of capital allele that that gamete carries. And this can vary between gametes that are produced by the same individual as illustrated here. But in, on an average, the genetic value of gametes produced by an individual is equal to half the breeding value of the parents because the parents passes only the half of their alleles. So four for, for the sire gametes and three and a half for the dense gametes. So the breeding value of an individual progeny then is the sum of the genetic value of the parental gamete and that combined to produce that progeny. So in this example, the breeding value for the first progeny is 7.5. And this is also illustrated an important concept, which is that progeny of the same parents don't have the same genetic value because of each progeny receives because each progeny receive a random set of allele for from each parents and these differences between progeny of the same parents are referred as a mendelian sampling terms so the expected or average breeding value of the progeny however is equal to the sum of the average genetic value of the parental gametes so it's equal to the half time of the breeding value of the sire plus half time the breeding value of the dam and which is in this case is a 7.5.
So, and this probability, the most important result on this slide, which is that the average breeding value of the progeny is equal to the average breeding value of the sire and the dam. And this average breeding value directly translated into differences in the phenotypes because phenotype it is, is a sum of genotype and environment. Thus, then the expected phenotype of the uh, progeny is the average breeding value of its parents plus the overall mean. And this is also gives a way to get a breeding value of an individual which can be computed as a two times the differences between the average phenotype of that individual progeny and the overall mean at least when that the sire is mated to a random group of dams. So now the factor two here comes from the fact that progeny only receive half the breeding value of the sire and other half from the dam. And this also illustrates the importance of selecting animal that have a high breeding value for breeding for producing the next generation. Because parents with a high breeding value tends to produce a progeny that have a higher phenotype. And this is the main concept behind the genetic improvement. So we can try to select animals that have a high breeding value and then use them to breed for the next generation. So the problem, however, is that we never know the true breeding value of any individual, but we can estimate the breeding value based on phenotypic information and which include their own phenotype as well as phenotypes from relatives. And if we have a genetic marker, we can also use that genetic uh, marker information. So now own phenotype provides the information because animals with high breeding value tend to have a higher phenotype, at least if that trait is highly heritable. So the phenotype of the relatives, uh, however, also provides the information on the breeding value of an individual because relatives, uh, relatives share also allele. So for example, if an individual has a progeny with high phenotype, that it's likely that individual has passed on a good allele to its progeny and therefore it has a higher breeding value. Also, if the full sips of an individual, full sips of an individual also uh, likely have a higher breeding value then the individual likely also have a high breeding value because the individual share allele with its full sips. So in practice, also this type of information can be used to estimate the breeding value and animal breeder have a developed a statistical tools uh, or a, a model uh, like a block based linear unbiased prediction that optimally utilize all of this information and to estimate the breeding value of an individual in a population. And this estimated breeding value, we can use to select the best sire and the best dam for breeding because progeny of parents with a high estimated breeding value tend to have a high breeding value and therefore have a high phenotype as we have seen before. So animal breeder routinely compute estimated breeding value on the, all the individual in a population using all the phenotypic data and all the pedigree information that available. So in, this, in swine industry, estimated breeding value is the common terms used for this evaluation. But in other species, like for dairy cattle, the term that is often used is a predicted transmitting ability. And this is also equal to half of the breeding value of an individual. And predicted transmitting ability quantify through its name what is transmitted to the next generation or a progeny, which is again the half of the breeding value. And in beef cattle, in beef cattle, the term that is used is expected progeny differences or EPD. And an EPD of an individual is equal to half of its estimated breeding value and reflecting that progeny only receive half of the breeding value from their parents. So estimated breeding value, expected progeny differences and predicted transmitting ability are the most important tools that animals breeder have to make genetic progress. They are routinely obtained on animals in a breeding population for each trait of interest and selecting the best animal for breeding.
then result in the progeny generation that has a better average phenotype than the parental generation and that reflects the genotype so in the progeny generation to select the best animal based on estimated breeding value to produce the grand progeny generation that again is a better than the progeny generation resulting in continuous genetic improvement so in this example uh, like for example in pig uh, for uh, for a days to reach a 250 pound weight uh, in a us direct population it shows a steady decline in the average genetic uh, value since about 1997 1997 and this has resulted in a peak that now reach a higher market weight on sustainable less feed as illustrated on the left side so what is genetic correlation so how we were selecting for a growth not only result in a genetic change in a growth but also in other trait that has a genetic correlation with the growth for example in a pig a back fat has a positive genetic correlation with the growth trait so selecting for a growth also tend to increase the back fat genetic correlation and represent the correlation between that breeding values so the genetic correlation so the genetic correlation between growth and back fat is equal to the correlation of the true breeding value of an individual in a population for a growth with their true breeding value so genetic correlation are caused by a quantitative trait loci that affect both traits which are referred as a pleiotropic qtl so when considering all the qtl that contributing to the breeding value for a trait one and all the qtl that contributing to the breeding value for a trait two like back fat is a trait one and growth rate is a trait two as indicated here uh, there is the genetic correlation if some qtl affect both the traits so genetic correlations are different from the phenotypic correlation which are the correlation between phenotypes observed for a two traits among the individual in a population so the phenotypic correlation between two traits is a combination of genetic correlation between two traits and the environmental correlation between traits so environmental correlation between traits are caused by the environmental factors that affect the both the traits so this table uh, gives an example of estimation of genetic uh, correlation among the pig for example the feed conversion feed conversion has a negative genetic correlation with the average daily gain but the positive genetic correlation with the back fat and selection for a growth rate will not only improve the growth rate but it will also reduce or improve the feed conversion rate uh, as a result there is a negative genetic correlation so in practice breeder never select on a single trait but multiple traits are selected on simultaneously so for example we are not only want to improve growth rate but also reduce a back fat so we have to select simultaneously for increasing growth rate and reducing back fat back fat so one way to accomplish this is the practice called as an independent culling level selection so this involve the setting a threshold level for a estimated breeding value for a growth rate and a threshold for a estimated breeding value for a back fat and then only use animal for breeding that exceed the threshold level for a growth rate and that below the threshold level for a back fat and this is illustrated in a graph this is illustrated in a graph and the cloud of a point here reflect the positive correlation between estimated breeding value for a growth and back fat consistent with a positive genetic correlation between those traits so with the threshold given by a blue color line an animal that fall in the lower right quadrants are the ones that we select for a breeding based on this strategy and now not the selected selected animal have above average estimated breeding value for growth rate and below average estimated breeding value for a back fat so we can use that animal for a further breeding so apart from this uh, an alternative 
and actually better way to select multiple trade is a practice which, which is called as an index selection. So this involves the computing an index for each animal as a weighted sum of its estimated drilling value for the trade that are in selection. So now the weight have can represent the economic value for each trade. So the effect of increasing that trade by one unit on profit. So in this example, the economic value of growth would be a positive and that of back, foot, uh, back fat would be a negative. That animals selected for breeding are then ones whose index exceed a certain threshold. For this example, this is represented by individual that fall below the red line in this figure on the right side. So from this illustration, it is clear that these two strategies do not select the same animal. And specifically, index selection allows animal with estimated breeding value for growth that are below the independent threshold for growth to be selected if their estimated breeding value for uh, fat makes up for the differences. So now it has been shown that index selection result in a greater response to selection or a greater genetic gain in profit, which of, a, of course is the ultimate goal. So the genetic improvement of quantitative trade or how we can use genetic selection to change a population of animal in a desirable direction for one or combination of quantitative trade. So we will discuss the first of all principle of genetic improvement, then the factors that affecting genetic uh, improvement, then the general structure of breeding program in context to pig and limitation of breeding program in context to pig. So these are the learning targets. What is the most effective way to make genetic improvement? What factors can change by breeder to increase the rate of genetic improvement? And how do pig breeder create a genetic improvement in the commercial crossbred pigs? And why it is so much difficult to create a genetic improvement in litter size, disease resistance, then in the growth rate and back fit. So the principle of improving the population of animal over the generation through genetic selection is quite simple. It is based on matching the best to the best and to do as quickly as possible. And you know, the world select the best male and best female from your population and use them for breeding the next generation and then do as quickly as possible. Of course, this is raised many questions. Most importantly, when we refer to the best, the best uh, animal for what and how we we do we identify them. So, if our aim is to improve the population for an overall breeding goal, then we learn in the previous slide that we can find the animal that have a best genetics or best estimated breeding value for that breeding goal by selecting them on an economic index and their estimated breeding value for important traits and combined into an economic index. So thus, we can use the estimated breeding value to identify the best because that's the best estimate of the animal's value as a parent. So in other words, animals with highest estimated breeding value are expected to have a best performing progeny. So in fact, as we have seen in the previous slides, we can predict the phenotype of progeny based on the average estimated breeding value of their parents plus their overall means. So genetic gain or response to selection, which is often denoted by data G, is defined as the increase in the mean phenotype of a population of a regeneration as a result of selection. So genetic gain from the current to the next generation is equal to the differences between the mean phenotypic phenotype of the progeny and the mean phenotype of the parental generation. And because the mean phenotype of the progeny is a direct function of an estimated breeding value of a parents. And we can also predict the amount of genetic progress we are expected to make from the current to the next generation by computing how much better the selected parents are compared to all the individuals in the current generations. 
So for example, if the current generation is made up of 25 males, the current generation is made up of 25 males and 25 females selection candidates and we want to select the top 10 males and top 20 females to produce the next generation what we would do if we would rank the male and female based on their estimated breeding value for the trait under selection or if it's lacking on its economic index of their index value and then to predict the response to selection response uh, then predict to response to selection from the current to the next generation we would take the average estimated breeding value of the selected sire which is in the case of 135.7 while uh, the se selected uh, dams which have estimated uh, breeding value have a 91 so the so the average of those the subtract the average estimated breeding value of all selection candidate weighted equally male and females which is around 52.6 percent so this gives a differences of 60.8 percent uh, 60.8 which says that the genes that the selected parents passed on their progeny have a genetic value that is on the average of 60.8 higher than the genetic value of the current generations and the and as a result we expect that the average phenotype of the progeny generation to be a 60.8 units higher than the average phenotype in the current generation so we can give in a genetic progress of 60.8 units this graph shows the response to selection that has been achieved in the u.s purebred yorkshire population for days to market and this is computed based on the average breeding value of all the animals in the population by birth year on the x-axis so pig born in 2009 on an average required 10 days fuel to reach a 250 pounds uh, uh, market weight then the peaks born in the 1989 so that a rate of genetic improvement of a half a day per year for a peak and this is the result of a continuous rounds of selection each generation now one of the unique property of genetic improvement is that genetic gain is permanent and cumulative so if you do a one round of selection then you expect the progeny generation to be a better because you have a selected parents that have a higher breeding values and therefore a higher frequency of favorable alleles at this are passed on to their progeny so genetic improvement is a result of an increase in the frequency of favorable alleles in the population but this change is permanent because you don't expect this frequency to change if you now stop selecting so one round of genetic improvement is expected to result in a permanent increase in the genetic value of a population now if you now continue genetic improvement by selecting in a progeny generation we further add to that improved base that you have established as a result have an earlier round of selection so genetic improvement is both permanent and have accumulated which make it very powerful tool and the power of genetic improvement is clearly demonstrated in this example as we shown in pig as i have shown before now required only 15 percent uh, required 15 percent less feed to reach a 25 percent higher market weight than the pig that have a 24 years ago in dairy cattle in dairy cattle the milk production per cow has almost quadrupled over the past 70 years resulting in a 60 percent reduction in number of cows while still doubling the uh, u.s uh, milk production and a large part of this improvement is the result of a improved genetics but perhaps the most dramatic example in genetic improvement in broiler chicken which is illustrated here it shows that broiler at seven week of age 
at market age using 2005 genetics versus 1957 uh, genetics which both of them being raised on the same diet so very dramatic change through genetic selection happened in the chicken so however genetic improvement has not worked for all trade for example in dairy cattle there has been a steady decline in a cow fertility as production level has increased and there is also has been a steady increase in the incidence of health problems and in a part that have been due to a unfavorable genetic correlation of this trait with the trait on the selection with the milk production so as we selected for increased milk production we have also inadvertently selected for genes that have a negative pleiotropic effect of fertility and disease resistance because this unfavorable genetic correlations so now the problem has been that we have not had the tools available to identify animal that have a better fertility or that are the genetically less susceptible to disease on the left graph on the left graph however you can see that this has changed the dairy cattle in 2001 for fertility which is when genetic evaluation for fertility were introduced in the us and which then allow breeder to not only select for production but also we have to focus on fertility uh, so by including estimated breeding value for fertility in the economic index that is used for the selection so similarly in the swine selection for litter size that has a limited and we have also generally not has been very successful in selecting uh, for increase the disease register simultaneously while increasing the milk production or growth rate to further investigate why genetic improvement has been more effective for some trait than the other trait we need to dig a little bit deeper into the factor that affect the rate of genetic improvement and that is clearly captured by the formula shown here which is called as a breeder's equation and it says the genetic gain per year is the product of intensity of selection accuracy of selection and the genetic standard deviation which is denoted as a sigma g divided by generation interval now here the genetic standard deviation is the square root of genetic standard deviation is the square root of the genetic variance and reflect to extent to which the genetic difference for a trait and this is the characteristics of a population and cannot be influenced by the breeder the other three factors are however to some degree under the control of the breeder and can be used to optimize the breeding program so first of all the i is the selection intensity and which depend on the percentage of selection selected uh, individuals or selected group so so if we select a smaller percent from the top we expect a higher intensity so if we select a hundred percent of individual we have a no selection intensity and if we have to we have select only 10 percent then the selection intensity is around two so the accuracy of selection which is the accuracy of estimated breeding value for the index that you are selecting and is defined as a correlation between the true and estimated breeding value so if accuracy is high then that means that you can better identify animal and that have a best genetics which increase the genetic gain so accuracy generally is higher for a trait that have a higher heritability because phenotypic correct is for higher heritable trait contain more genetic information and that all data are less noisy so accuracy also tend to be higher when the animal has its own phenotype or if it is has a close relative with phenotype that are used to estimate a breeding value so now litter size is a trait that has a low heritability and therefore estimated breeding value for litter size tend to have a low accuracy which make it difficult to make 
a lot of genetic progress for litter size. In addition to litter size, uh, it is a sex limited trait. So males don't have their own phenotype for litter size and this is further reduce the accuracy of their estimated breeding value for litter size. And finally, females, they don't have their own phenotype for litter size, but only after the first calving or first farrowing. So we can get uh, after first farrowing the data on litter size. So we could wait with selection until female have produced their first litter and to be able to induce their own phenotype in their estimated breeding value that would increase the accuracy of selection. So however, this will also increase the another factor that has a negative effect on genetic gain per year, which is the generation interval. And then it is the average age of parents when their progeny are born. So intensity, time accuracy, time the genetic standard deviation, predict the genetic gain per generation. So if we want to express this on a per year basis, then we have to divide by the generation interval and by the number of year it takes for one generation to turn over. So the breeder equation allows you to evaluate that for different scenario and based on their design and best breeding program. So if in practice, selection in male versus female is often different. So in terms of they have a different intensity and accuracy of generation interval. And the example of litter size illustrated that in that case, we need to add up the breeder's equation as it is indicated here, where we have a gender specific selection parameters, the intensity, accuracy, and the, and the generation intervals. So the, in this typical uh, structure of pig breeding program, the breeder equation allow us to predict a genetic gain for alternative selection strategy and then to identify those that are result of a best genetic gain. So however, in this breeding program are more complex system and then that there is, it is reflected in that equation and it's important to appreciate the full scope of modern breeding program. So this diagram shows a typical structure of a breeding program of a swine breeding industry. It is typically consist of a two maternal lines. It is typically consist of a two maternal lines and one long terminal style lines. The dam line often are Yorkshire and Landris, while the terminal line can be a Duroc or Python based. So now much of the selection take place in the pure line that are at the top of the pyramid and which are the typically kept under the high biosecurity in what we call as a nucleus herd. So that is where most of the phenotype recording and genetic selection take place. So period genetics that is created in the nucleus herd is often then passed onto their production level through one or more step of multiplication and cross breeding. On the maternal side, the two dam lines typically are crossed to produce a F1 show to, to cap capitalize on a maternal heterosis. And this cross breed show are often uh, mated to the boards uh, of Duroc and board of Duroc and Pycran uh, from the terminal line or parent par maternal line. So to produce a crossbreed, to produce a crossbreed peaks for a growth and finish phase. So the separation of the sire and dam lines also allow the selection program within each line to be specified. So for example, in the sire line, there is really no need to select for a litter size because that does not impact productivity at the commercial level. So the only trait that you need to select for a terminal site are related to the growth rate, trade efficiency, and meat quality. But on the female side, there is need to produce a crossbreed source that have a higher litter size 
So female fertility and the piglet mortality are the additional traits that are selected for in the dam lines. So in this system, continuous genetic improvement is created at the nucleus level and this is then passed on but with some delay to the multiplier and then to the commercial level as illustrated here. So the slope of the lines that you see here as the rate of genetic improvement is determined by the amount of genetic progress that is achieved in the nucleus. So while the distance between the lines or also called as a genetic legs, line genetic legs are determined by the number of multiplication generations as well as by selection that take place at multiplier levels. But the slope of the line is completely determined by what happened in the nucleus. So as I have already indicated that this system has been very effective for traits such as growth rate and back fit and which have reasonably higher heritability and can be measured in all the animals of a younger age giving high accuracy of selection and low generation intervals. But the reproduction trait, but the reproduction trait that have a lower heritability and having a low estimated breeding accuracy. So in this system has been limited because of low heritability of litter size and because litter size can only be recorded in female and at older age. Therefore illustrated, so this reduces the accuracy of selection and it is increasing the generation interval. While meat quality is the another set of trait and that are difficult to improve by genetics. So in particular trait such as color, water holding capacity of the particular peak, pH which requires the animal to be slaughtered. So these traits can be definition can by definition not be recorded on the selection candidate which reduces the accuracy of selection for these traits. While our main focus the disease Disease trait is another example of a trait that are typically not available because of high biosecurity in the nucleus hearts. So their disease data is not recorded on the nucleus animal on the selection candidates. And finally, a limitation of this program is that all the selection in the phenotypes are recorded on a purebred animals in a high health nucleus herd. And this may not reflect the performance of crossbred pigs in a commercial herd where you have a exposure to a disease. And as a result of uh, and, and as a result of often only a part of the genetic gain that is created in the nucleus may be a realized in the crossbred pig in the field. And that, that is the another issue that today breeding program are trying to deal with. So uh, to mitigate these uh, limitations uh, by using a genomics is one of the possible solutions that is currently being pursued in that regards. So use of techniques of genomics for genetic improvement. Here I have illustrated like marker association analysis by using a genetic marker or QTL. We can identify a particular uh, region in which a trait of interest we have to study uh, while marker assisted selection and finally the widely used uh, selection uh, recently in recent era is the genomic selection or genome wide association study so this is the future of in vitro breeding and uh, efficient uh, this is the future in which the efficient isolation of pluripotent embryonic cell from cattle embryo allow the development of in vitro breeding schemes based on the embryonic stem cell gametes cycle, including the intermediate genomic selection is to provide a directional selection of genetic progress. If such scheme could be accomplished, it would be significantly decrease the generation interval and allow for increased selection intensity and lead to accelerated genetic program uh, progress. So these are the genomic selection of superior bulls and cow. So we, we can uh, retrieve the uh, genomically selected cow's embryo and genomically selected uh, elite bulls uh, sperms. 
and uh, by using the IVF technique, we can segregate that embryo to the recipient animals, and we can get a good and um, uh, good calves calf from that uh, elite uh, genomically evaluated animals. So the genomics for animal health. Traditionally, the selective breeding focus on handling and productivity traits such as docility, fit conversion, and fertility with modern breeding uh, goals incorporating animal health and welfare. So the toolbox for genome editing like homing endonuclease, natural meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, transcription activator like effector nucleases, and clustered regulatory or cluster regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats or CRISPR or associated Cas9 system. So these are the genomic genome editing tools which can be used for the uh, producing a transgenic animal or uh, disease resistance animal. And these, these are the vehicles we can use to produce a uh, good transgenic animals or uh, a disease resistance resistance animals. So genome editing in cattle uh, face some significant challenges due to a cost, small number of offspring, long generation times because nine months of gestation and around 18 uh, months to reach a sexual maturity. So in cattle, we can use the most preferred genome editing techniques such as somatic cell nuclear transform, cytoplasmic microinjection, pro-nuclear microinjection, and in future, the potential future editing technique like editing of spermatogonial stem cell, which can retrieve from the male uh, scro scrotum, uh, and we can edit that spermatogonial stem cell uh, for a disease resistance. So these are the genomically manipulated animals. So these are the various techniques we can use to produce a disease resistance animals. So genome editing in sheep and goat. So small ruminant have been generated by somatic cell nuclear transfer and goat by sperm mediated gene transform. And genome editing in pigs, pig also have been modified by somatic cell nuclear transfer, microinjection, or transform of zygote in an effective alternatives. Genome editing in chicken is somewhat difficult, but currently relies on primordial germ cell that are edited in vitro and transformed into a recipient embryo. So primordial germ cell can be isolated, cultivated, and genetically modified while maintaining their uh, primordial germ cell status. So use those cells to establish a chicken uh, line. And chicken PGCS may be modified by microinjection or transfection reagent and transposon into a bloodstream of embryo to generate a germline modified animals. So mustard is, is the most uh, economically uh, affected uh, economically affected disease and Staphylococcus aureus is the most common pathogen and there is very low nature of heritability of resilience to infection. So in cattle, uh, the antibiotic lysostaphin was introduced by somatic cell nuclear transfer resulting in a secreted protein in their milk and capable of killing a Staphylococcus aureus. While in goat milk, the human lysosome was shown to inhibit the growth of mastitis causing bacteria, and which is called as a Pseudomonas phrasei, and which is responsible for cold spoilage of milk. So the bovine, uh, while the bovine spongy uh, form encephalopathy in cattle and scrap in sheep and goat, so misfolding of prime protein is associated with the degenerating disease. So accumulation of prime, misfolded prime protein plaques and result into a bovine spongiform encephalopathy and scrappy disease. So knock out these are the prime protein gene to circumvent this disease. And uh, prime protein knockout extend to a uh, biopharmaceutical. Uh, this is the new concept to alleviate a BSC and scrappy. So and and last one, the episodic pneumonia, which is called as a shipping fever, which is produce a cytotoxic uh, leukotoxin and leukotoxin bind with CD18 protein to present on the cell surface leukocyte. 
So based on the human sequence like zinc finger nucleases were used to introduce a single amino acid chain and this result into a leukocyte from the resultant fetus were resistant to cytotoxic associated with menhemia hemolytica. Uh, while uh, the bovine tuberculosis, the polymorphism of NREM gene or SLC11A1 gene in cattle is associated with varying level of resilience of uh, bovine tuberculosis. So in this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, genome editing method were used to target the insertion of a NREM variant associated with resilience to bovine tuberculosis infection in cattle genome. So these are the in vivo and in vitro study were taken to challenge against the bovine tuberculosis and to mitigate the uh, current nauseous infection in bovine, bovine industry. So these are the advances in delivery techniques such as genome editing for livestock disease resistance like intra and interspecies variants, genome-wide association study and in vitro host patho pathogen infection study. These are the various uh, approaches which is used for the disease resistance in animals. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I forget to one more mic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for your nice presentation. Uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, somewhat a vast uh, topic. So, yes. as uh, as possible, as uh, I covered all these things and some another recent techniques uh, which is employed in a livestock industry so uh, that we uh, that is a very vast uh, other core area of genomics so yes. I, I, I able to cover uh, most of the things thank you okay 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 thank you dr chaudhary so we have dr bp bramshatri sir and uh, karadi sir also so first of all uh, i request to dr bp bramshatri sir so to please highlight uh, on uh, regarding our topics and give some tips which will be useful uh, to fill that dr bp pram sir please sir please on your mic hello 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 yes 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 sir please write down your comments sir. <laughs> Dr. B.P. Sun from Shatri, sir. They're not on mic. Okay, sir. So I request Dr. Karadi, sir. I think uh, he's also not on mic. Dr. Karadi, sir, please, sir. Dr. V.B. Karadi, sir, Principal and Dean of the College, Nausari Agriculture Institute, Nausari. Okay, uh, so both the dignitaries are not on mic. Uh, okay, sir, thank you, sir. Uh, we have more, one more personality. Dr. Mamta Madam. Dr. Mamta Madam, Associate Professor, Department of EGB, Veterinary College, Nausari. Madam, please on your mic.
can you hear my voice earth earth yeah yes sir uh, i am hearing your voice okay okay mamta madam please on your mic you are on mic I think Mamta Madam left. She cannot join again. Okay. The presentation will be available to all of you, so please don't worry. So, at the end of this webinar, I request to. my colleague and organizing secretary of this webinar series dr deepak suthar for word of thanks dr deepak please thanks to all the participant who joined with us i am also thankful to the honorable vice chancellor sir dr sunil choudhary sir give the permission to organize of wet nau webinar series 2020s and give the strong positive support for this series and also provide the basic facility for uh, conducting this webinar series sir i am also thankful and i am also thankful to the our dean and principal dr vibhi kharadi sir for presence today's webinar sir uh, your presence is remarkable and uh, sir also uh, your strong support regarding this uh, webinar series and valuable suggestions for how to improve this webinar series thank you sir i am also thankful to the director of the it department dr pandya sir and his entire team of the it department provide the digital platform for the webinar series i am also thankful to the co organizer secretaries and my friend dr lalit modi is uh, because without his support this series is not possible and uh, is always with me so finally the thanks to the today's speaker dr arth choudhary for the nice presentations and excellent explanations of this webinar series i am also thankful to the research scientist of the lrs of uh, sdu sk nagar dr panchasara sir to give the permission to present this webinar on digital platform of the e learning and i use i am also thankful to the uh, bb uh, bp brahmachatri sir uh, for the today's presence in uh, uh, in webinars sir thank you i am also thankful to the mamta ma'am since uh, presence today's webinar and i am also thankful to all the participants joined with us so next sunday meet with the next uh, new topic with the new speaker till then namaskar thanks once again all the participants thank you sir thank you dr arth choudhary for nice yeah. presentations and very well explains uh, of this uh, topic okay thank, thank you, you. yeah then, and thank you all the participants thank you